the system of equations We must deal with them all at once Always looking for solutions Positive outlook overcome Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is for linear algebra students who have just gone through the invertible matrix theorem, the largest theorem, I think, in linear algebra. And what we're gonna do in this video is use that theorem on a few examples. So let's just dive right in. This first example, very simple, can a square matrix with two identical columns be invertible? Why or why not? Now I want to demonstrate kind of the proper way to think of the answer to this question and the proper way to phrase an answer to this question. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually hop back to the invertible matrix theorem because we're talking about invertibility here. And that is key to this whole conversation. So let's go ahead and hop back to the invertible matrix theorem. And I'm gonna go ahead and use the table I created in the last video. If you have not watched my previous video, you just have to think of it this way. The middle column is the invertible matrix theorem. The outer columns are actually older theorems that got blended into the invertible matrix theorem. Now, the premise of this example is that we have a matrix with two identical columns and it's a square matrix, that's what's important. So if you think about that, two identical columns, what does that mean about those two columns? Well, it means they're multiples of each other, which means that all the columns in the matrix itself form a linearly dependent set. If you look through the list, and we know now from a long time of working with linear algebra, a long time being probably about a month, that linear dependence of columns is a precursor to a lot of results with theorems. Specifically, the columns of A are linearly independent, means that all of that information, S1 all the way through to T15, all those would be true if the columns of A were linearly independent, but we will know that these, that these columns in this matrix they've handed us are linearly dependent, so everything in that column is false, specifically this statement right here, that A is invertible. So thinking wise, that's kind of how we're gonna go about this. We're gonna think like, okay, what does it mean to have two identical columns? And what does that mean for the resulting matrix? Now let's formalize that statement. We'll start with a nice clean statement. Let A be an N by N matrix with two identical columns then the columns of A form a linearly dependent set. Now, depending on your instructor, they might want a little more justification than you just saying, well, if a couple of columns are identical, then the entire set of those columns is gonna be linearly dependent, even though that's actually very true. If your instructor is one of those instructors, you can reach back to a theorem we learned a long time ago that said the following. A set of two or more vectors is linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. And I'm only writing this in blue and in parentheses because I would not expect my students to actually go this far. I would believe them when they say, then the columns of A form a linearly dependent set. However, if your instructor doesn't like that, go a little bit further here and just say a set of two or more vectors is linear, linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. And then you can name the two vectors that are identical like this. Let V1 and V2 be the identical vectors in your columns. Then V1 is equal to one of those V2s because they're the same plus zero of everything else. That's a linear combination of all of the other vectors in the columns of A. Again, the blue ink, generally speaking, is probably not going to be required by your professor. So now I can say, well, since the columns of A form a linearly dependent set, well, A is not invertible by the invertible matrix theorem. QED, and by the way, I write QED there because really we just proved a statement. And the statement we proved is not really big enough to be called a theorem, so I probably would never call this a theorem. It might be a corollary or something like that, a little baby theorem, but it is a theorem nonetheless, or a baby theorem nonetheless. And if your instructor needs you to prove that A is not invertible by the invertible matrix theorem, 
Well, then they're asking you to actually prove the invertible matrix theorem at that point. Uh, but we will assume that we've already proved the invertible matrix theorem or that you could just read it out of your textbook for these problems. By the way, every time you go through a problem, this is something that I realized when I was a student pretty late in the game, honestly, but every time you go through a, a problem like this, when you prove something, you can then use that information later on. You could say, I did an example a long time ago where I proved that a square matrix with two identical columns is not invertible. So in the future, if something like that comes up, you could just say, oh, no, that's not invertible because it has two identical columns. Onwards and upwards to our next example. Is it possible for a square matrix to be invertible? <laughs> if I stop there, the answer is yes, but there's more to it. If its columns do not span Rn, why or why not? Now, this is so single step here that I'm a little bit concerned that I might make this too easy. But the reality is there's just no way around it. If we already know the invertible matrix theorem, we could say, let A be an, a square matrix where the columns of A do not span Rn. The simple answer to this question is, no, it's not invertible. Why? Well, going back to the invertible matrix theorem here, if the columns span Rn, then the matrix will be invertible. However, if the opposite is true, the columns do not span Rn, then A is not invertible. And that is by the invertible matrix theorem. Thus, A is not invertible by the IMT. One way you can believe this though, without just blanket grabbing something from the invertible matrix theorem, is to think about the fact that A, the columns of A, will not build all of our codomain, Rn. So there are going to be some vectors in Rn that are not able to be reached by any vector in our domain. That is, there are vectors B, which cannot be the right-hand side of that equation, or in other words, that you will not have a, a solution for some to this equation for some vectors B in Rn. If A were actually invertible though, then A would be row equivalent to the identity matrix. That means through the elementary row operations, you can transform A into the identity matrix. And that means those same row operations will transform the right-hand side into A inverse B. If A were invertible, that would be true. And you would have a solution to this for any vector B. But we already know, because the columns of A do not span Rn, there are some vectors B for which this equation has no solution. There are multiple ways of stating the answer to these questions, by the way. That's gonna be not tricky, it's just gonna be one of those things where when you look at somebody else's solution, they might have used a different part of the invertible matrix theorem to showcase that A is not invertible here. That's perfectly fine. I like to take a short path, but some people like to go roundabout and that's okay. What about this guy right here? If L is a square matrix and the equation LX equals zero has a trivial solution, I love these questions. Do the columns of L span Rn? First of all, this is like one of those tricky true-false questions uh, that the author of the textbook that I use loves to ask, and I think they're so neat. If I said I have a square matrix, oh, and by the way, the homogeneous equation here has a trivial solution, you should say, duh, every homogeneous equation has the trivial solution. So they're not giving us a lot of information here. They're just saying, suppose I have a square matrix and a homogeneous equation. That's literally all they said. Do the columns of L span Rn? Well, if all you're gonna tell me is I have a homogeneous equation and a square matrix, the answer to that is I can't guarantee it'll span Rn. Why? Because it is just a basic fact that every homogeneous equation has the trivial solution. They have to give us more information. If the homogeneous equation has only the trivial solution, then I would say, you know what? The columns then would span Rn. Unfortunately, we are not told that the homogeneous equation only has the trivial solution. So how will we word this? 
if the homogeneous equation only has a trivial solution, then the columns of L span Rn, and that's, by the way, by the invertible matrix theorem. However, if this statement here is not true, in other words, the homogeneous equation has more than the trivial solution, then the columns do not span Rn. And that is by the invertible matrix theorem. Again, this is like the constant from this point forward. You're going to say by the invertible matrix theorem, by, by the invertible matrix theorem. There are some theorems that aren't really tied into the invertible matrix theorem. So don't get in too much of a habit of that, but it is true. And notice all of these examples I'm doing are pretty fast. It's because all I need to do is turn back a page or two and look at the invertible matrix theorem and say, well, no, this condition is not satisfied. So none of the conditions are satisfied or yep, that condition is satisfied. So all of those statements are true. Well, let's suppose that we have again, a square matrix. That's a theme, right? with the property that the homogeneous equation has only the trivial solution. Without using the invertible matrix theorem, explain directly why the equation AX equals B must have a solution for each B in RN. So this time our hands are tied. We cannot reach back to the invertible matrix theorem. However, we're allowed to use any other theorem up to this point, so I will. Let A be the square matrix where the homogeneous equation AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Well then, by the uniqueness equivalence theorem, A has a pivot in each column. Let me show you that. Now I get it, I'm on the page that has the invertible matrix theorem. However, I'm not gonna look at it. Don't look at it. The uniqueness equivalence theorem states all of these conditions in this column are equivalent. So if the homogeneous equation AX equals zero only has the trivial solution, then A has a pivot in each column. However, the number of columns that A has is equivalent to the number of rows that A has, correct? Because it's an N by N. So if A has a pivot in each column, then A must have a pivot in each row because you can only have one pivot in any given row or column. So if A has a pivot in each column, let me scroll over and skip that middle invertible matrix theorem column. And if A has a pivot in each column, then A has a pivot in every single row. We have bridged the gap between the uniqueness equivalence theorem and the existence equivalence theorem and now that we're in the existence equivalence theorem, we can say AX equals B has a solution for each B in RM. And that's what we're gonna use here. So I'm just restating what I said out loud with my handwriting. By the uniqueness equivalence theorem, A has a pivot in each column. Since A has N columns and N rows, A must therefore have a pivot in each row. That's the bridge over to the existence equivalence theorem. And by the existence equivalence theorem, AX equals B has a solution for all B in RN. Not too bad. Didn't have to actually touch the invertible matrix theorem. It's just a property of having a square matrix. And finally, what would a set of examples be without a transformation question? The transformation from R squared to R squared is linear and is defined by, well, that right there you can see. Show that this transformation is invertible and find a formula for the inverse transformation. Now, first of all, I just wanna say, I dislike how this is written and I wrote it. I much prefer it written like that because it's easier to see the standard matrix for this transformation when it's written like this. The standard matrix is going to be five, seven, negative three, negative six. So now that I know the standard matrix for the transformation, to show that the transformation is invertible, all I have to show is that this standard matrix is invertible. And that comes from, you guessed it, the invertible matrix theorem. T is invertible with T inverse equaling A inverse X is true if A is invertible, where A is the standard matrix. So all we need to do is show that the standard matrix A is invertible. Then we know that the transformation is invertible and we know the inverse transformation is going to be A inverse X. Let's go ahead and do it. 
I'll first check to see what the determinant of this matrix is. I'll call this matrix A, by the way. Remember, the determinant of A is AD minus BC. That is the product of this main diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal. Perfect. So we see the determinant is non-zero, which tells me that A is invertible, which by the way, is not actually part of the invertible matrix theorem. And it should be, to be honest with you. It's not that I left it out. It's just that the author for the textbook that I use doesn't write it right now. It will be written at some point. But the fact is we know that A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is non-zero. And I'm looking to our previous theorems here and it is in our list of previous theorems. It's this guy right here. The author could have included this in the invertible matrix theorem. If the determinant of A is zero, then A is not invertible. And we wanna ask the other direction. What if A is not invertible? You, you may think that this statement doesn't say that if A is not invertible, then the determinant is non-zero, but this statement actually does say that. Remember, with if then statements, the contrapositive also has to be true. So the contrapositive to this statement is A inverse does not exist implies the determinant of A is equal to zero. So we have both directions. Determinant of A is equal to zero, then A is not invertible, and A is not invertible implies determinant of A is zero. Why do I say all that stuff? because we could have added it in this list. I would have put it down here as determinant or D 16, which is saying as long as the determinant of A is non-zero, that is true if and only if A is invertible, which is true if and only if all the other statements in this table are true. So we have actually added an additional statement to this list. So the determinant being non-zero here tells us A is invertible, which implies that the T inverse exists, the transformation is invertible. That's by the invertible matrix theorem. And to find a formula for T inverse, we'll just go ahead and find out what A inverse is. Remember, A inverse for a two by two matrix is actually easier than for any other size matrix. It's one over the determinant times the matrix where you swap and negate. Swap the main diagonal and negate the off diagonal. That's swapping the main diagonal, and that's the negation of the off diagonal. You can bring that negative one ninth in if you want to, and that is the inverse transformation right there. Not too bad. So I hope this gave you some confidence or hope with the content when it comes to the invertible matrix theorem. You're really reaching back to that theorem repeatedly to help you. I hope that I see you in future videos and I hope you have a wonderful day. Be a good human. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at Listen close, don't talk too much, that isn't cold. Sure, you may really hurt inside, it doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry.